So obviously, uh, spiritual warfare is one hundred percent practical. Uh, we're dealing with devils, spiritual forces that hate us as believers. Don't want us to be effective. Don't want us to be effective in the community. Don't want our families saved. Don't want us to share the gospel, and when we do share it, want it to be completely ineffective. <clears throat> and generally, want us uh, gone from the earth. Uh, that's that's sort of the level of, of warfare we're in, and a lot of people don't even realize it. Um, we'll get to this list in a sec, but I want to just start with a couple sort of principles um, about this war. Let me pull up this. Let's go to Matthew 12, verse 24. Start here, Matthew 12, 24. Matthew 12, 24. And, and, and again, the purpose of this is so that when we're dealing with things like, you know, someone is attempting suicide and we're dealing with that sort of situation, what, you know, what's going on behind that? Um, because there's a lot of just sort of Christian spiritual tradition where we just kind of do work for however we feel like doing it and say things we just feel like saying. Um, but it's not in the Bible, you know. But there is plenty of good ways to, to learn how to fight that is in the Bible. And we want to do that because that, that works. Um, so we're going to look at Matthew 12, 24. So Jesus is... Um, he just dealt with someone who was possessed with a devil, uh, blind and dumb, and he healed him so much that the blind and dumb both spake and saw this. Verse 22, all the people were amazed and said, is not this the son of David? Now here's, here's where it gets interesting. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. So the Pharisees here are accusing Jesus of using a dark power to work this work against devils. It says, And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? I want you to take note that Jesus just brought a huge revelation to the Pharisees. Because the spiritual dynamic of our world was not dealt with in the Old Testament. You didn't have, you know, David's mighty men running around casting out devils. Now they were dealing with people made of this stuff, flesh and blood. All the wars in the Old Testament were physical. You know, God tells you to go into a land, you fight the people, there's the person, I can see them, we fight, we win. That's how it is. But our wars are not like that. When we take the community for Christ, we don't go and kill all the unbelievers. That's not, I don't know. If you see that, that's not Christianity. <laughs> that's not in here. Jesus didn't say, go into the whole world, and if they don't believe you, kill them anyway. No, no, no. That's not how we win a situation. But we are at war. Ours is invisible. But here we see Jesus is saying, Satan does have a kingdom. And that's a big deal. And a lot of people just sort of dismiss it. But Jesus is saying here, Matthew 12... Verse 26, um, Satan has a kingdom. So we have to recognize that. Spiritual warfare is kingdom versus kingdom. So Matthew 12, 26. Matthew 12, 26. Versus kingdom. And once again, my chalk skills are excellent. <laughs> I know you'll all be jealous by the end of the night. As always. <laughs> so we need to realize we're not dealing with um, we're not dealing with someone who's just running around uh, with no plan, no scheme, no structure, right? Satan has a kingdom, so it has structure. It has a system of control in it. It, it has a function, and its primary function is to come against God's kingdom. As we see, this is any time Satan shows up. He's usually going against the things of God. We very, very seldom find him just relaxing on a beach. <laughs> He's very active against the things of God or against God's people, whether it's physical, Israel, whether it's us spiritual as the body of Christ. Uh, He's against us. And if you don't realize that, you're going to kind of, you know, 
wake up and go, why is this going on? You're not just having a bad day. You don't just have like dumb luck. You know, you're not just like, oh, I'm just cursed. No, no, no. There's actual spiritual entities at work against us. Uh, I want to look at a couple other things about him so we know who we're dealing with. Go to 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Again, this is who the Bible says. This isn't, you know... A lot of people have opinions. We don't want their opinions. <laughs> we want what the Bible says. So 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. And it's important to see what the Bible says because our enemy, the devil, he's invisible. We can't see him. We don't get to just walk over and peer into his kingdom and take notes and see how, how he works. But he's called this here. And it's, it says, um, I'll read from verse 3. You know, Paul talking, But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them who, that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Uh, and you're going to see this a lot with the devil in his kingdom. I want you to see that phrase. He blinded the minds. Right, blinded the minds. Much of our battle takes place right here, in our mind. So, so he blinded the minds. So they can't see, they can't perceive something that they need to see and perceive. So he's keeping knowledge supernaturally from people. It's remarkable. And we'll look at 2 Timothy 2.26. 2 Timothy 2.26. Paul says we're not ignorant of Satan's devices, yet sadly so many people just you know, think he's running around with a pitchfork, <laughs> you know, and a fork tail, dressed in red, and they go, you know, I know how I'll recognize Satan, because that's how he looks, right? That's how he looks. So 2 Timothy 2.26 says this. There we go. Um, it talks about, and that they, uh, let me read from verse 25. Uh, actually, read from verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. I, I find that system in, interesting. Because when people start rejecting the truth, what they're doing, they're actually in, uh, opposing themselves. They're their own worst enemy, so to speak. Right? Hello. Hello. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> okay. Awesome, awesome. Let you get situated. <laughs> you have it this much? And what you have, I've got it on video. I'll go over this for you real quick. We're just in 2 Timothy 2.26. That's the last verse we're looking at right here. So 2 Timothy 2.26. So we've been looking at, we haven't gotten into this yet. We've just been looking at, in Matthew 12.26, Jesus reveals that Satan has a kingdom. And if you don't know that, you're going to wonder, who am I fighting against? Who's fighting against me? He has a kingdom, so he has a, he has a system of government that he functions with, that functions under him. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, he's called the God of this world, small g, not big g, small g. Uh, and his main function there, we see that he blinds minds. It says he blinded the minds, because much of our warfare is in, is in our mind. And you know, it was with thoughts, it was with imagination. Um, the devil will take as much as we, we give him. So now we're just looking at 2 Timothy 2.26. <clears throat> um, I'm reading, I'll read from verse 25 again. In meekness, instructing those who oppose themselves, if peradventure God will give them repentance to the acknowledging the truth. And here's verse 26. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. That's remarkable. So the devil can take people captive if he wants to take people captive, but he has to do it through this. Through snares. He has to trap people in order to take them captive. However, I want you to notice 
Though he can track people, though he wants people and he can get them, if, you know, they're not uh, realizing what's going on, uh, I want you to notice, verse 26, it says, And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Whatever you're trapped in by the devil, he doesn't have power over your will to see yourself come to a place of freedom. You can always get free from the devil. And that's really good news. <laughs> Imagine if we got in a trap so deep that we couldn't get free. But there's no trap the devil can spring on us, no snare where we can't get free. And so that has to be understood as well. Because you see someone, they're caught in a demonic situation, you have to know they can get free. You have to just know that. Otherwise we lose hope for people. We go, oh my gosh, it's so dark, it's so evil. No, no, they can get free. They can get free. Though, yeah, the devil got them, they can still get free. And so let's look at, um, kind of, we're just going to look at it very lightly, very lightly, but we do have to look at it, because uh, we, we get a real good picture of his nature and character. So let's go to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, we're going to look at verse 12. Isaiah 14, we'll start at verse 12. We get a very, very interesting um, prophetic view of our enemy here. So it says, Isaiah 14, 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? I want you to notice that. He weakened nations. It's remarkable, right? So this is looking, this is a prophetic picture after the devil's been defeated from Isaiah's standpoint. But we see the enemy loves to weaken not just people, but he deals on a national scale. That's remarkable, right? So the enemy is really, he's involved on that level, nations. But that is because he has a kingdom. And kingdoms are concerned with other kingdoms. They're concerned with other nations. So if he can control a nation, then he can control the people under. If he can bring a certain mentality over that whole nation, then it's much harder for the body of Christ, for the church to function underneath that whole system that he imposes on a nation. And we see that, like for example, in um, China, you know, a communist mentality over the whole nation, the body of Christ has a very hard time functioning under that. And that's a national, a national system he's imposed. Uh, but look at this, verse 13, right? For thou hast said in thine heart, this, and this is remarkable, we're getting actually the thoughts of the devil revealed to us in Scripture. What an amazing thing. Thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will ascend into heaven. He's like, no, I'm, I'm going up. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. You notice that? So the devil's got a throne. He's got a throne. And he should have a throne because he's a small G God of the world who has a kingdom and he has a throne. All right, he has a kingdom, he's got a throne. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend. Remember, it's all those eyes. I will, I will, I will, I will. When you hear someone say, I'm into this, I'm into that, I'm into this, that's actually this demonic nature working in them. All right? If I said, oh, I'm going to do this in Wimengi, and I'm going to do it, no, no, I just say, Aaron, we need to leave. Because <laughs> if it's not Christ in us, it's over. Right? It's God working with us. It's not like, I'm into this, and I'm into that. No, you just listen to me, you know. No, 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 that's weird. It's not, that's not it. It's Jesus working with us. Right, we're never without it. <laughs> if it ever just gets to the point where like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that, it's a demonic nature that's coming to the surface. And, and that's the nice thing. When you see all these, I will, I will, right, you can recognize it right away. Right, if some leader is saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and they're not saying I'm going to do it with the Lord, or they don't understand that co-laboring with Christ, right away we know there's a demonic thing working in them. Right? The devil's got them. Usually it's a pride situation. So I will exalt my throne above the earth. I'll sit on the sides of the I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be, and this is the kicker, I will be like the Most High. Wow. So he's going he's gonna to pretend to be like God. 
And that's really what we see his primary work today. Right? I will be like, I will be like the Most High. Because he doesn't come in, right, with a dev with a horns in a red suit and a pitchfork. He comes in probably how you'd like him to come in. Very nice. Right? Transforms himself into an angel of light, we're told. An angel of light. Though he's not at all, but that's how he wants to be perceived. He is, his greatest deception is if you think he's just like Jesus. That would be, that would, that would just make his day. <laughs> you know? That would make his day. I will be like the Most High. So we see this function in his heart. We see what he's wanting. He's wanting exaltation. He's wanting the prominence. He wants to be the, you know, the prima donna. He wants to be the star of the show, right? That's the devil. So I always find it interesting when anyone who's supposed to be a spiritual leader ends up wanting that as well. <laughs> they want prominence, they want to be the star show, they're not lifting up the body of Christ, they don't see how we all need each other, right? As soon as, as, soon as we stop saying, oh, I don't need this person, we're, we're in a very dangerous position that the nature of the devil is working in us. So let's go to John 10.10. 10. John 10.10. 10. Because we have to, you know, again, Paul said we're not ignorant of, of the devil's devices. We're not ignorant of how he works, his schemes. Um, and so this is why, you know, so much the Bible does reveal, like the fact that it reveals what's in Satan's heart. It reveals how he works, how he attacks. Even when Paul says we're not ignorant of Satan's devices there, um, he's dealing with how we need to make sure we're forgiving each other, forgiving our brothers in Christ. Because he knows if we don't live in a place of forgiveness, the devil has something in us where we start to hate our brother. And then he can work that division in. So we just, you know, people are going to be people all the time. <laughs> you know, they will disappoint you. So you just have to live lightly. Don't let them, you know, don't expect too much from humans. <laughs> you know, and just if they, they screw up, just say, okay, Lord, all right. Just don't let that unforgiveness take a place, right? Paul calls it that root of bitterness which defiles many, which is, we don't want that. We just want to live lightly, keep the forgiveness flowing. But here we see in John 10, 10, Jesus is saying, you know, I, I'll read from verse 9. He says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Obviously, so in the idea of salvation, you ain't getting saved if you go any other way. <laughs> if you're going to ascend into heaven, as Satan said, I'm going to ascend through any other means, other than Jesus Christ, nope. <laughs> no, it's not going to happen. Right? But Jesus says here in verse 10, The thief cometh not for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Right? Steal, kill, and destroy. So when you do see the work of a devil in a community, you usually see that. You see lots of theft, lots of destruction, and lots of death. That's just the, that's the very nature of the devil on display. When you see that, when, you, when there's just constant theft and, and, uh, and just things being destroyed. Uh, we've been in some communities, yeah, where that, you see that just out in the open. You have burned out cars just all the time and things just destroyed everywhere. And you just know the enemy's at work there. But all this is to say, you know, even though he's at work, there is a reality in us to believe a greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. It doesn't matter if he's the God of this world. Small g, small g. You know, the earth belongs to the Lord. The whole thing, right? The devil runs, yeah, the systems of men and all their little schemes, but it doesn't matter because Jesus is king of kings. He's Lord over all of it and we're the body of Christ. So even though, even though Satan has a kingdom and has a throne, and steals and kills and destroys, we must always remember Romans 16, 20. <laughs> right? Always remember Romans 16, 20. Because the devil will puff himself up in your mind. He'll try and say, look how awesome I am. You know, you'll go into a situation maybe where someone's, uh, you know, possessed and, you know, there can be wild things happening there. 
But you have to know your position in Christ, and you have to know the devil's position as far as authority structure. Right? Romans 16, 20 says, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. So all this, as wonderful as it is for the devil, that's a horrible picture. <laughs> there we go. He's, he's under that. This is the believer. This is the believer. Okay, right? so he's under our feet. All that to me, his king and his great power, his hatred for mankind, everything he has, sorry, still under the feet of the believer. As awesome as he is. And we just have to realize that. It's not our idea, it's what God says. <laughs> I know some days it doesn't feel like it, but it doesn't matter what we feel like. It's a faith walk, not a feeling walk. <laughs> well, I don't feel like he's under my feet. Yes, I know, but he is. So start speaking and start attacking. We have to go on the attack. And that's really good news. Because as, as much as he's done, like used armies and used people, and you know, like when he attacked Job's sheep, brought fire down out of heaven and burned it up. All of that still under the feet of the believer. Under the feet of the body of Christ. That's amazing. That's amazing. That's the level of authority we have. Because the authority structure looks like this, right? We've got God. And you've got, right, the body of Christ. Of Christ. And you've got the angels of God. Of God. We're going to go here. Right. Then you've got the devil, and his angels, and then you've got mankind. This is fallen man. Once you're saved, boom, you move up here. But if you're not saved, the devil's over you. The devil is over you. So our job, right, our job as the body of Christ is to come down here and lift them back up to this position where they're supposed to be, up here working with God. Not under the devil, not under the world system, not trapped in despair. And that's what we do. Because that's what God did for us. He sent his son to come pull us out of the miry clay and set us on the rock. And that rock is Jesus. And that's our job now. That is our job. <clears throat> well, how's it our job, Aaron? Well, let's go. It's a good question. Let's go to Mark 16. We're just going to touch on it real brief and then we'll move on. Mark 16. I need like two. There we go. So we're getting into our stuff. Mark 16. Very familiar passage to us all. Jesus is leaving. He's going back to heaven. Now before he does that, he tells us in Matthew 28, he says... Go into all the world and teach all nations and teach them everything I've taught you. And then in Mark 16, it's the same situation, so we get more of what he said. We'll read uh, from uh, verse 17, right? And these signs shall follow them that believe. I want you to notice, we love the thing in 18, they lay hands on the sick, they shall recover, but he doesn't start with that. He starts with verse 17, in my name shall they cast out devils. It's, it's that warfare is going on right away. Because very often, if you come up to someone and say they're sick, a lot of times, what's going on, there's a devil working against them, and you, you can pray for them all you want for healing, but if you don't deal with that spirit, it just keeps affecting them, right? It's like dealing with the effect and not the cause. And so Jesus is all about dealing with the causes, right? So in my name shall they cast out devils. That's before um, speaking in tongues. That's before, you know, the taking up serpents. So you've got dominion over the animal kingdom. You drink in the deadly thing that shall not hurt you. Uh, you lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. Before all those good things, in my name shall they cast out devils. So Jesus is very clear to make sure point number one is you have to deal with the devil. You must deal with the devil. Because if we don't deal with the devil, we're not doing our job. We're not doing our job. You can't go into someone who's tormented and just say, oh, the Lord be with you. And say a nice prayer over them, you know. 
or give them a nice sandwich or give them a hug. All those things are good, but we're told to cast the thing out. And it's not complicated. Uh, we get situations where Jesus would just use cast the demon out with his word. Let's look at that verse. Uh, so you just see it here. And let's go to... Let's go to Matthew 8.16. Matthew 8.16. Matthew 8.16 with word. The thing I like about the life of Jesus, he's very spiritually economical. He does it the simplest and best way. He doesn't get all, you know, fanatical and weird. He just said, this is, this is what works. Verse 16 says, uh, uh, When even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all that were sick. Right? Just quick. Spast, cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all that were sick. Uh, he just does that time and time again. We never see him spending a day counseling, you know, a spirit out. You don't counsel devils out. You cast them out. It's a command, right? It's just a command. And usually when we see Jesus doing it, he says, come out of him or go. Um, the man who, uh, look, let's look at verse 5 in Matthew 8. It says, when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him, saying, Lord, my servant lie at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented, Jesus said unto him, I'll come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. And I want you to hear this, because Jesus says, I have not found so great faith. Because remember, this whole system, we go, oh yeah, we want to cast out devils, we want to see the power of God and all that stuff. It's going to happen by faith, meaning it's going to happen in your trust and your confidence in God based on his word. Not based on anything else. But I want to put this one verse here. But that is the only question that the devil wants to know from you. Do you know who has the authority when you come into a situation? Because faith is all about authority. Faith is about authority. Right? It's where, and that's why we looked at this, right? Where are you in the structure? Right? You're not under the devil. <laughs> you're not under angels. Because now you're in the body of Christ, so you're above angels. So you have to know your position of authority. And that word I always bring up, right? With authority comes responsibility. Responsibility. So when we get into a situation, we see someone who's sick or someone who's tormented, the responsibility is on us now to do what he told us to do, right? If you love me, you keep my commands. One of the commandments is, cast the devils, lay hands on the sick. You know, that basic stuff. We don't need to get weird about it. Just do it. <laughs> Just do it because he told us to do it. And that, that's it. So look at what this man says here. Matthew 8. Uh, the centurion answered, verse 8. He said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof. Look at this. But speak the word only. Speak the word only. Isn't that what we saw? Jesus cast out the spirits with his word. This centurion said, Speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man, and this is why. He understood. I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. So he says, The reason I have soldiers that listen to me is because I listen to someone above me. He's not operating in his own authority. He's operating because he's under authority and his servants operate under him. So I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh, and my servant, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. 
What a remarkable thing. And so that's what we want to be like. We want to be doing things by not just faith, great faith. So it's about authority, but authority that's in the spoken command. Right? It's authority by command. Authority by command. I've often thought, you know, when you're dealing with, say, a spirit tormenting a child, it would be fantastic if I could see that thing and wrestle it and <laughs> tackle it to the ground and, you know, just shake that thing. But that's not how it works. It's not physical. It's not, as we'll see in Ephesians when we go there, it's not flesh and blood. That's not what we're wrestling with, right? It's spiritual. It's invisible. And so the invisible authority responds to words. It's by command. But if we don't think we're anything, and that's the devil's job, to come on and say, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? And we go, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know who I am, you know? Uh, well, that's what the Bible's here, to tell us who we are in Christ. It doesn't just tell you who Jesus is. It tells you also who you are in that relationship. And again, it's about that responsibility. Okay, I'm the body of Christ who's in heaven. Well, what am I supposed to do? Well, we have things he's told us to do. Uh, because it is. It's about that authority. So if the devil can convince us, you know, when he challenges us, like a snake will challenge you sometimes, if he can convince you that, that um, you're not here in the body of Christ, you're still just little old you, poor you, you had a bad day, so he gets to do whatever he wants. If you believe that, you're going to have a real hard time. You just are. And, and sadly, a lot of people, if you don't have, if someone's not preaching the word to you, or you're not hearing it, or you're not around people where you can encourage each other, that's hard. Let's be honest, right? That's hard. It's not like easy. <laughs> okay, I just might feel amazing. We don't always feel amazing, right? But again, it's not how we feel. It's what the Bible says about us, which is why it's, it's just so important to see uh, what it says about us. So, um, yeah, we see this. The, uh, it's important to see that everything here is going to work by faith, but it's also going to work by our understanding of the authority structure. You're under authority. Like, why are you bothering to cast out a devil? You know, like, the, the boys, the spirit of suicide is attacking them. Right? Well, who says you get to help? By what authority are you helping him? Well, I'm doing it based on the command Jesus gave to us in Mark 16, saying, believers will cast the devil. So if I say I'm a believer, then that instantly qualifies me to then be responsible. Right? It qualifies you for responsibility. Right? And you say, okay, that person's being tormented by a spirit that's trying to what? Kill, steal, and destroy. That's what it wants. You know, you don't, that's all that those devils want. They want to kill them, they want to destroy them, they want to steal them, and, and all at the same time, because very often, you know, a suicide doesn't just take out that person, it destroys the parents, it destroys the brothers and sisters, it affects the community, darkness flows into that situation. It's a huge evil, and it's, it's something that we have to fight. But this is why it's also important. What did that man say? He said, look at verse 8. He said, I'm not, so Matthew 8, 8. I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. Speak the word only. So the servant is back there, you know, where the man lives. And he's like, I don't even need you to come. But that word, when you say it, will travel through time and space. And will go to my servant and push that thing off. I believe, he said, Jesus, I believe that because you're under God, that the words you speak, sickness and disease, must listen to you. I believe it's like your servant, that's how I understand it. So if you just tell it to go, I believe it can hear you from here. What a thing he said. Most people in here are like, if I can just get to Jesus and touch his garment, or come touch my child. This guy's like, no, I know authority. You just say it and it's done. It's amazing, right? Jesus is like, this is faith. Yes. Yes. I mean, I thought about it so yeah. before she told me. Mm. I didn't know, like, I didn't know I had the uh, authority or anything. I didn't know really about anything, but I just, uh, her, um, she was on my mind. Mm -hmm. and then I heard suicide. Yeah. And when I heard that, I was like, kind of. Very simple though. Yes, totally. And two days after she told me one time, and that's what she talked about. Yeah. She wanted to commit suicide. Yeah. Then I heard 
Then I let her finish her story, and I told her that I prayed over her here, and she was invisible. Yes, exactly. With my words, I yes. commanded that spirit to leave her alone. Exactly. And then it was short, like you said, you know yeah. what? <laughs> Well, I know. Honestly, like if, if a, dog, a mean dog came in here, we're not going to give it a paragraph. We're going to say, get out! <laughs> we're gonna, you know, we're going to be real short with it. And that's it. It's a devil. You don't need to write in a poem <laughs> of the glory. You know, I'm just, it is just quick to the point because that essentially it's like we're hitting the thing but with words instead of our, our hands, right? So it is. It's to the point. You know, it's like, you know, if, if, if you're telling, you know, yeah, I think it's just a wild dog is a perfect example. When if it's coming at you, you're very short to the point with it, telling it to go, telling it to get out of here. You know, very short commands, and and that's how I see I see devils. They're just like crazy little dogs running around, biting everyone's heels, right? But but much more serious. But that's it. See, at least, and this is the thing. Like we may not understand all this, but there's that Holy Ghost in us does. <laughs> He's like, this is what you're going to do. You're just going to pray and command, and it's going to happen, right? Because he already kind of brought her to mind with like a word of knowledge. But you know what's going on, and you pray, and then you find out after. And that's important. Yeah, exactly, right? That's important. But why did I do that? And then you find out, right? Um, and that's just about being sensitive to the Spirit. You know, learning to be led by the Spirit. And, that, and, and you know... Because, yeah, there are, like, even these guys, we, we have the benefit of having the Bible now. Now I can go, oh, you know, turn to Matthew. But Matthew didn't have Matthew. <laughs> you know what I mean? Matthew, he's living it, and then afterwards he's writing it down. And then he had it after he wrote it. He's like, oh, yeah. You know? But we have this wonderful benefit of being able to peer in to this, to this their whole world and, and get understanding like that. You know? But at the time, they're just, okay, what does faith look like? And, you know, so much of that first few years of the Yoga Church was just that, having to be, like, the Holy Spirit that was poured out on Pentecost was not like, oh, that's nice. No, it was necessary, because <laughs> they didn't have the Bible, like, they didn't have Paul yet in Acts 2, you know? Paul comes, shows up a few years later, after he first persecutes them, right? So, they needed that reliance on the Holy Spirit so strong, but that's why it's like, yeah, it, it's the balance, and then once we get the, the reliance on the Holy Spirit, we're trusting Him, then He can show us, and this is why. Because you have the authority in the name of Jesus, right? Your position in the body of Christ gives you that authority. It's not our authority, but it's His authority because we're in Him, right? And, that, and that's the thing. Um, but we have, to re, we have to realize that, because the devil will always try and minimize who you are in Christ. You always say, oh, you're nothing. Or you've just been saved a week. You can No, no. If you've been saved a week, you have authority over any devil in the world. It doesn't matter. You may not understand that, and the devil will try and convince you not because you, you don't know some stuff, but once you're in the body of Christ, he's above every devil. And Romans 16, 20 applies to you right away. So it's, it's awesome. But now it is. Now it's like, okay, now let's get some understanding, and let's really do some damage to the kingdom of darkness. Because even in the communities here, when you hear about... Like this week we got out here, the week before, we're hearing about like 12 deaths and suicide and weird accidents. You're like, this is just devils having too much control, right? And it's not, it's, it's not right, you know? And so we need to start taking back the territory, you know, literally taking back the land. Because as we'll see, when we start getting into this, and I don't even know if we'll get into this tonight, but this is going to get pretty amazing, because we're going to see... When God told Joshua to go in and take the land, we're going to see that all these tribes line up with the spirits mentioned in the New Testament, and then the antidote is also the armor of God in Ephesians 6. God shows us how to beat them. It's awesome. Because God wants us to win. <laughs> He's like, I'm going to arm you to the teeth. I'm going to give you my spirit. I'm going to give you my word. I'm going to send you forth, not just to lose, <laughs> you know? So that, uh, so that everyone you know dies, and you know people are sad, but at least you're a Christian, and that's nice. No, we're supposed to affect, be able to affect change, right? So, it, you know, if there was a funeral and Jesus showed up, it stopped being a funeral and started being a party, right? Young man's dead, you right there. There's the funeral procession, but Jesus shows up, and it's no longer a funeral procession at all. And that's how it should be with us as believers, right? We're, we should be known to affect change. 
but when again you don't know that you're in a war and really like even though he's under our feet you know he's still crazy the devil's crazy you know he's just i'm gonna he wants to fight god anyone who literally thinks they can fight god is nuts so that's who we're dealing with we're dealing with some wild crazy insane creature who wants to destroy us because we're made in the image of God. Hates mankind above all things. Uh, but it doesn't matter. We still win. But we're going to get some tools together to show, to show us how we win. But the first thing is, understand our authority. Again, if we don't know who we are, you know, positionally, then the devil can come and convince us, what right do you have dealing with this situation? Why are you praying for that person? No, it doesn't matter. We have an authority in Jesus and a responsibility to cast out devils. Responsibility. And that, that keeps it from being flaky. Because a lot of times when we start talking spiritual warfare, people get weird. <laughs> you know, it can go like, ah, into really weird spots. But just keep it grounded in the responsibility we have as Christians to help people. And that's really it. We're just helping people. So let's jump in here. Mm -hmm. I want to look at... Um, just the, we're going to look at four occurrences. So we're going to leave Satan behind here. And we're just going to look at his underlings. We're going to look at devils. Devils. And we're going to kind of look at their nature and, and see what they want so that we can really spot them really quickly. And you're going to, we're going to find, like, this suicide thing, this is, this is their nature. <laughs> it's absolutely their nature. So let's go to Leviticus 17.7. This is, like, the first time... It shows up in the Bible. Leviticus 17.7. 7. Leviticus? It's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. So third book. Third book. Right back at the beginning. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. And it's chapter 17. And it's verse 7. And this is the first time the devil shows up. And when we look at the Bible, there's something called a law of first mention. So when something's first mentioned in the Bible, the idea that comes with that is generally carried out through the whole Bible. Because that's the first time it shows up. So this attribute of it, you see through the whole Bible. So Leviticus 17.7 says this. So this is talking about um, Israel... Uh, and it says, And they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils after whom they've gone a whoring. This shall be a statute forever unto them throughout their generation. So we see right away the devil, devils, plural, right? Not the big guy, the little guys. Devils want this. Woo! <coughs> 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 They want that. They want sacrifice. They want sacrifice. And you see that throughout the whole world. It doesn't matter what religion you're dealing with. If there's a supernatural element to it, like an idol or things like that, there's sacrifice going on. Whether it's incense, whether it's fruit, whether it's some kind of act you have to perform for it. They want sacrifice all day long. And the greatest sacrifice we see that they want is children. Children. You go, why does the spirit of suicide attack kids mostly? Because this is what we're dealing with. We're not just dealing with depression, right? This is supernatural, a supernatural force, a devil. And this is what they love. They love to kill kids. Love it. And that's why our job is to stand there so they can't. Right? Because we're dealing with a spiritual force that, you know, getting in their heads. That's, like we saw, that's primarily, um, right, Second Corinthians 4, 4, he blinded the minds, primarily the devil's main area he attacks us is in our mind. And when you talk with kids who struggle with it, it's usually the thoughts. They just get bombarded with these thoughts and they don't have anything in them to shut it down. They have no tools to shut it down. And that would be awful. <laughs> just getting hit with thought after thought after thought after thought. You don't have something to say like, the helmet of salvation that protects our mind. It's the armor of God, right? It's practical. We, we usually look at Ephesians 6, we go, oh, the armor of God, hallelujah. No, it's very, very practical. <laughs> when you have that helmet of salvation on, when you know you're going to heaven, what's that give you? That gives you a hope. That gives you a hope, right? What do people who are attacked with suicide lack? They lack hope. 
They see no tomorrow. But the helmet of salvation now says, no, I have a tomorrow. My tomorrow is with Jesus. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to be with my friends and family there. Hallelujah. And that suicide spirit just ding, 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 bounces off that helmet. It's a real helmet. It's not just a fancy idea for our wall. <laughs> In a Christian office, the helmet of salvation. No, it's real. It protects us from suicidal thoughts. Pretty amazing. So Leviticus 17.7, we see these things want sacrifice, right? They shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils. Now we'll just look at one more spot here. Psalm 106. Psalm 106. That was Leviticus 17.7. And now we're looking at Psalm 106. What verse is it? Psalm 106, verse 37. Psalm 106, verse 37. Uh, and you can see it says it, it there, right? It, um, let's read from uh, let's read from verse 36. It says, and they served their idols, talking about the, the nations they went in into. They served their idols which were a snare unto them. Oh, there's that funny word snare. Remember that? Where was it? It was... Yes. Yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Right? This devil uses these idols as snares because they're actually representations of devils. Right? And when we talk about, say, going in and praying through houses, very, very, very often... When you go into a house and they have trouble dealing with spirits, there's things like, you know, maybe some masks they got from Africa on the wall. And they, oh, they're cool, isn't that hip? <laughs> no, they come with devils, right? Because these are, these are, are uh, sort of touchstones for the spirit to work through. And if you keep it in your house, it's been dedicated to a devil. So if you keep that thing in your house, that spirit has every right to be in the house because that object is dedicated to that spirit. So that's why when we're doing like house cleans or praying through houses, if you've got something in there that's been dedicated to a devil, the best spot for that is the fire. <laughs> the best spot. And we see that in the book of Acts. When Paul's preaching in Ephesus, what did they do, right? When a revival hit, they're all burning their witchcraft books and burning their icons. And, you know, it's pretty awesome. Uh, so 106 verse 37 says, Yea, they sacrifice their sons and their daughters unto devils. And I'll read verse 38. And shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and of their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan. Right? The Canaanites, which we'll deal with. Uh, and the land was polluted with blood. Thus were they defiled with their own works and with a whoring with their own inventions. So here we have, because... They saw, and so much of these idols, like idolatry in the world, is usually very pretty. Usually a lot of craftsmanship goes into these statues and little icons. A lot of them are brass or gold or silver, right? Like the issues that Paul ran into with the guys who made the silver shrines for Diana, right? He's running into there. They're like, hey, we're losing out on our money here because Paul's preaching against us, you know? And they had to attack him because they're losing their cut. But that's what's going on, right? These idols are very pretty to work at, work with or to have in your house. They're, they're nice, you know. The you know, carved mask is, you know, it's very beautiful. Uh, you know, a nice cultural icon. But they come with devils, and that's what we have to realize. We have to really, eat, uh, you know, so often pray about things that we have in our house. You know, Lord, should I have this thing here? Is this of you? <laughs> is there anything that's attached to this? That, it, you know, is wrong. You know, very often, I remember my dad telling me a story. When they were praying through someone's house, they, you know, they went into the house and the person kept being tormented by the spirit and didn't know why. But then they had a voodoo doll in the house. And voodoo, right, is black magic, witchcraft, where this doll is empowered by a spirit to attack another person. And so my dad threw the doll in the fire. And it started screaming. That's fun. <laughs> you know, when the little doll that he threw on the fire started screaming, and the spirit had no home anymore, and he had to go. You know, because these are not just cute little objects. So we, that's, that's just a good thing we can, we can be aware of. You know, so if someone's having issues in their house, 
and you've prayed through that house a thousand times, say, okay, do you have any garbage here from like some weird, you know, religious icons or stuff like that? Because that, if it's been dedicated to a spirit especially, the spirit has every right to be there. It, it sees it as its thing, right? It's, it, that's my toy. So we just get rid of that stuff. And we want to make sure, not only these temples are clean, but our houses are clean. And, uh, you know, I will say we do need to pray for Brother Randy because he's got all that Montreal Canadians <laughs> I idolatry. <laughs> Lord, deliver him. <laughs> but see, some things just get in people's hearts and that's it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I have uh, someone staying at my place that uh, recently um, felt a spirit mm -hmm. next to her, mm -hmm. and uh, she told me about it, and she said she couldn't sleep. And I remember um, one time watching something on TV that uh, this person had unforgiveness towards another person, and she she was a Christian. Yeah. But um, I guess the, the Lord spoke to her about her unforgiveness because mm. she was, um, there was a, somebody flickering the lights on and off in her house. Oh, and yeah. Some things were, were not right. Yeah. So I guess she uh, forgave and the spirit went away. Mm -hmm. They told the same thing. Mm, yeah. So I, I just told her uh, it could be that. Yeah. And I told her about the story I heard. And mm -hmm. Hopefully she, you know, she reads the Bible. She's reading the Bible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it only happened once. And I just said, you have to renounce that, and you have to. She said, I, what should I do? <laughs> yeah. How do I do I, that? Yeah, yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> Yeah. And he said, you have to say it. Yeah, exactly. Command it to go, but use uh, yep. in Jesus' name. Yeah, and like, you, you know, and that, because we go, oh, well, if it's a big deal with forgiveness. No, that's exactly what we were looking at in, in 2 Corinthians, where Paul says, we're not ignorant of the enemy's devices. And before that, Paul's teaching about forgiveness. Because, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, look, you have, if you don't forgive, the devil has access to your heart. Mm -hmm. Right? And we don't, we don't want him to have that. And so just make sure, yeah, if, you, if someone does something wrong, just forgive them. You know, like if they're evil, you don't let them in your house again. <laughs> but you can live free from them by forgiving them, you know what I mean? It's like you can be, okay, you're forgiven. I'm not going to carry that, that issue. Because, yeah, then the devil has a way of he can attack you. And, you know, we don't want that at all. But, no, it is, yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But even, even if it was, now for example, because she's in your house, and I, even if there now is a, say, a spirit and she's not in, in a, a place of forgiveness, you then can, and she doesn't understand or she doesn't get it, or say she says, or she lies and says, no, I'm fine, I did forgive them, and she didn't really, and that spirit's still there doing things in the house, you can still, as one who has authority over the spirit, Tell it to go, and, and when she goes, it can come back and harass her all. But because it's your house, you can take authority and tell that thing to go as well. So that, that's a, another option there. But yeah, still, she should definitely make sure she's dealt with all that stuff as well. But as far as your space, you know, your kind of territory, you can still take control over that whole situation. Like, I, if someone came into our house with a spirit, I could definitely, it, it's gone. You know, it can go. If they have issues, like it can wait outside the door. <laughs> you know, for them. When they leave, it can leave with them, right? But when you come in, no, 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 sorry. You're staying outside, buddy. Out in the rain, right? Uh, and it's just waiting there with its little luggage. <laughs> they can get it back if they want it back. But yeah. But that's why it is so important for us to just live. Man, we can't get so hung up on people. If someone wrongs us, it's, there should be like, uh, as soon as someone gets saved, welcome to Christianity, people are going to disappoint you. <laughs> but just forgive them anyway, right? Just, my goodness, like when Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's the heart of Christianity. That's the heart of it. And, and that keeps us free from devils messing with us, right? Keeps them out of, our, of this temple. 
which is really what we want. Um, so now let's start getting into it. We've kind of laid, laid a bit of a groundwork. Let's see, do, do we want to take five minutes and just take a breather? Yeah, let's just say, okay, we're going to take five minutes, chop up your coffee, and then we're going to get into some of this action. Ephesians 6. So 